Hi everyone and welcome to Adobe Live. My name is Flynn. I'm here with the fantastic Bill Hope. Uh, we'd like hey, to begin. Oh, hey Bill. We'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners on the land on which we meet today. We'd also like to pay respects to elders past, present and emerging. Bill, it's wonderful to have you back. Thank you so much for joining us. No worries. Very happy to be back um, talking with you. And this is like a very particular like session that's really close to my heart. Um, your book that you've created, we were talking about this, My Daughter Loves It. So I've bought this book that Bill is going to show us. Uh, well, this is the sequel to that book, um, and she absolutely loves it. So every night before we go to bed, my daughter is reading this book that was illustrated by Bill Hope. So it's very special. So we've kind of built this session around that, and the next book that Bill is going to be creating, he's going to take you through a lot of that. Um, hey, everybody in chat, r and is here, Golden Rose, Festus, Johanna, um, Bev, Aaron, Sam, Azara, it's wonderful to see you. If you're watching this anywhere else, uh, like over on YouTube, the chat that we're using today is behance.net slash live. So if you want to say hi, if you have some questions as we're going along, I'm just going to pop some music in. Um, so Bill, did you want to show us the book first while we've got our big screens up? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, so really keen to show off uh, a little bit of this project today. It's something I've been working on over the past year. Um, uh, I've been an illustrator working in commercial illustration for about eight years, but uh, I've only recently started doing more work in publishing. So it's been great doing this kind of stuff. So I'll show you the two books that I've got out so far. So the first one we've got here is Where's Santa's Elf? Um, and they're kind of what they call search and find books. So they're these uh, these books that have got very complicated sort of detailed illustrations mm -hmm. and you've got to find all different characters and, and uh, different items hidden within the book. So that was the first one that came out last Christmas. And just a, just a week ago, um, we had uh, Where's the Golden Egg come out? You can see that very cool golden cover I've got on that one. So this is an Easter themed book, um, uh, but along the similar kind of lines. So um, I was approached about a year ago, uh, sort of about a year and a half ago by Scholastic Australia to work on these books and they're kind of part of a series. Um, so I've done uh, one of the Christmas books and currently working on the sequel. So today I thought I'd just take you through um, one of the, the big pictures that I'm working on for uh, Where's the Elf, uh, Where's Santa's Elf 2? And um, I'll show you a bit of the process and uh, sort of how these things come together. And um, towards the end of the session, um, uh, we might do a little bit of uh, Christmas themed pattern making. Um, one of my favorite parts of doing these books is they have on the inside of the cover something called the end pages, which are sort of these just mm. nice pattern pages that might have been marbled or something back in the day. Um, but uh, I, I really love creating these kind of patterns. And there's a new feature within the 2021 Photoshop, which makes this uh, process really easy and fun. So, um, yeah, we'll have a look at one of the, the illustrations from this book. And uh, towards uh, the latest section of the, the session, we'll do a bit of pattern making based on on the theme. So, can yeah. you get started? All right, that sounds that sounds awesome. Um, and so, ladies and gentlemen, I'm actually not feeling very well myself. So, uh, people that are used to the show and used to seeing my my head in the corner and asking silly questions, I'm going to let Bill drive today um, from here on out. He's going to take you through everything, and I'm going to sit back and watch with the rest of you um, as I recover my voice. Um, so, yeah, Bill, okay. over to you. Thank you so much. Nice work, Flynn. All right. Okay. All right, everyone. I'm going to switch over to my desktop now so you can see what I'm looking at on my computer. And uh, I'm going to show you a bunch of things. Um, so uh, thanks to Flynn for being a, a trooper. He's, he's really done a great job today. Um, so anyway, hopefully, if you're seeing my screen right now, you can see uh, I'm working within Photoshop and I've got uh, this big illustration laid out. And um, this is, I think, the third page from this uh, new book that will be coming out uh, this coming Christmas. So um, with the first book, it was very much themed around um, uh, this sort of uh, festive uh, Christmas uh, land, and it was in the land of the elves. So everything was elves. 
um, uh, elf based. Whereas in this book, we're doing a sort of around the world tour. So it's going to be, where's the elf around the world? I'll show you some of the files that I've had uh, piecing this together. So when I start working with a the publisher, they really kind of approach me just with the title of the book. And, and then we start sort of piecing together things like uh, which characters will be in the book. So you can see here, I've got some bios of different characters that will turn up. Uh, we start talking about a basic plot line. I might start thinking really early on about what a potential cover could look like. And we're sort of just piecing together what's the, the theme or the vibe of this book. So we ended up going with uh, Around the World. So I got to choose all these uh, nine, there's gonna be nine big spreads within the book. So there's nine locations around the world that um, I'm drawing. So we've worked through a couple of them already. Um, uh, the first one that I did was a, a drawing uh, in the Blue Mountains of Australia where I live. So we've got this sort of crazy bush scene with a waterfall and climbers and all sorts of things. Uh, the second one was working on was this uh, amazing place in Italy called uh, Cinque Terre, which some of you may have been to. So it's this sort of as your coast Italian seaside scene. And the one that I'm going to show you today is um, a scene that we're doing uh, based within England. Um, it's a bit of a funny story with the, this one. I, I wanted to draw something that was sort of this really uh, sort of archetypal English scene. And um, uh, so I wanted there to be sort of a uh, an old British pub and there was going to be a steam train and, and uh, big old bridge, sort of a cute village in the background, a little bit of a castle going on here got a Spitfire plane. I'm just sort of chucking in uh, a melange of, uh, of every sort of British reference I can think of. So I sketched up this drawing and I was showing it to a, uh, a British illustrator who I know. Um, and he said, oh, it looks like Nairsborough. Now, I've never heard of a place called Nairsborough, but I looked it up on Google and it basically there's a town that exists that is the drawing that I drew. So, um, uh, so this drawing we've, we've named as uh, Nairsborough in England, which is this uh, beautiful old village that has an aqueduct that goes over a river and steam trains go across this aqueduct. It's incredibly idyllic. So um, this is this is the big drawing that I finished uh, just yesterday. And I thought I'd go through the file and show you a little bit about how something like this is pieced together. Um, you can see on my side panel here in Photoshop, I've got uh, literally hundreds of layers that make up this big complicated drawing but where it all starts is just in a simple sketch so if i go right to the base this is kind of where i start off with a with a picture like this it's just a uh, um, a, a pretty loose simple sketch uh, when, when i'm sketching i kind of do it in layers so i'll start with something really rough then i'll start working on a layer on top of that and kind of refine the drawing as i go so this is probably round two of, of those kind of drawings uh, so you can see I've got all the characters in there, everything's there, but it's in this very sort of simple uh, um, uh, simple sketch format. So if I drop the opacity on that way down so it's a, a nice transparent file, if I scroll up to my, um, my figures folder on the side and I get rid of the colors, you'll be able to see just the line work. So this is kind of the... Um, the foundations of the picture, just this simple black and white line work on top of a sketch. So once I've got my line work there, I begin this process of building up um, layers and layers and layers of detail into these pictures because you really want it to be something that is a kind of a visual overload in a sense. You want it to be something that you can really kind of get get lost in. So you want to be adding as much as much detail as possible to these things. So it's a real process of sort of iteration and building up. Um, with these things. But with it being a commercial project, it's something that I'm trying to do um, uh, at pace, really. It's something that you need to turn around to a budget um, uh, and within a timeline. So with the way I kind of think about these pictures is that it's not the, the best picture I could possibly do. I mean, I, I'm doing the best job I can but it's, it's as much detail and, and the highest level of picture I can do within the constraints that I have for the, the, the job. So I'm, 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 it's an interesting project to look at in Photoshop because I'm trying to build up as much efficiency as possible throughout the, the whole process. So I'll, I'll show you, uh, I keep um, all the sections of drawings um, in, in folders and in layers so I can edit them. So you can see I've got the, the train station here that I can turn on and off. Um, over here, I've got uh, um, a pub that I can turn on and off. Um, and I keep all of these things separate. So I have 
um, the flexibility to change things as we go. Because I'm hiding lots of little items in here and there's lots of multiple characters, I want the flexibility to be able to sort of adapt and change things as we go. And with a picture this complicated, you want everything to be clearly labeled and separated so you sort of know where everything is. So what I thought I'd do today is um, just add in one character into this big scene. It's probably got 100 characters in it already, but I just want to add one more. Um, and um, uh, that might be a good way to sort of show you the process of how something like this comes together. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this white layer over the top, and that helps me sketch on top of this image without getting too lost in the detail. And um, um, uh, quite a lot of my family actually lived over in the UK, um, and uh, my cousin um, has recently had her first son, and um, uh, she likes, um, she's got the, the first of the, these um, these books, and um, is, is keen to sort of be able to show them to her son um, when he's old enough. So I thought it would be a fun idea to um, uh, add her and her, her son into this picture. So I'm just going to quickly start sketching up a figure and hopefully it'll be a nice thing I can hide in there um, once the, the book is, is done and released. So I've just taken a sort of uh, a, a very basic six pixel across brush and I'm just going to start sketching. Um, so again with what I was saying is with this I'm, I'm, I'm sort of trying to develop a style of drawing that is something that I can work uh, quickly and, and efficiently with that's got character it's a children's book so you want it to be sort of um, cute and fun but it's um, something that you want to be able to do quickly because you need to sort of turn around quite a lot of this stuff so I'm just kind of loosely blocking out this figure here um, I'll start adding in so we're gonna have a sort of adorable mother and child scene here my cousin will have to forgive me this isn't gonna look particularly close to her but it's cartoon character so it's okay I'm just going to drop my pixel brush off. And right now, I'm just sort of loosely blocking out um, uh, what this character is going to be like. Um, yeah, with these characters, it, it's sort of developing this style that's adaptable um, uh, across all kinds of things because uh, I'm drawing sort of pirate captains and train conductors and cricketers. I'm sort of drawing all sorts of things. So I want some sort of really sort of visual shorthand um, for, for how, to, how to make these characters work. Forgive me for struggling a little bit here. It's been a bit of a process for me learning how to um, draw cute babies. I have a bit of a habit of drawing them as a sort of old men. There's a, if, if you want to do a, a, a Google image search, you should look up um, uh, babies in Renaissance paintings. Um, the, the monks that were doing Renaissance paintings obviously had not spent a lot of time around children and uh, um, the babies that they would draw into, into these um, sort of religious paintings were often um, hilariously misconstrued. Um, and there's a grand tradition of uh, bad, bad baby painting in, 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 the, in the Renaissance. So um, as you can see, it, it's, a, it's a really large file, this one. It's, it's 400 by and um, uh, 70 centimeters across. Uh, um, but still, there's so much detail that as you get close up, it's quite a pixelated image that I'm, that I'm drawing in. Um, so, um, but once you zoom out, you kind of, it all, it all fits together. So that's feeling okay for sort of like a little baseline sketch of these two hanging out on this uh, train platform. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to just white out the background. So I've got a nice simple background to work with. I'll drop down the opacity of that sketch and I'll start doing the, the line work. I like to think of these drawings as really kind of, um, um, I guess the difference between like a, uh, a, a marathon and a sprint, um, these drawings are very much in the marathon category. You have to sort of try and uh, develop ways of working that will allow you to do it uh, for long periods of time um, to sort of just get through the, the volume of work that's involved. So my, it, it, it's actually really changed my, my working habits doing these, these books. Um, my, my sort of, Standard routine is, is uh, getting up at six and spending about two hours just doing sort of line work like this. Um, and then once it gets to eight o'clock, I kind of 
start my day, but I've got a, a bunch of this sort of uh, line work already done. Um, so again, I'm just keeping it really, really simple, but trying to keep these, these cute little characters in. So here we go. The trick with babies, I think, is that they've got actually quite small faces and these enormous foreheads. So the, 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 their face kind of sits within the lower lower half of, of, of their heads. I'm just going to do a little adjusting there. It gets quite abstract being uh, this close up to uh, these drawings um, because you end up sort of so, so pixelated. But again, I'm just quickly sort of uh, sketching this one out. One important thing for me with doing these drawings is um, I'm, I'm always looking for a way to sort of speed up this process or make it more efficient. And um, one of the ways that um, I, I find really effective doing that is um, making sure that um, the, the drawing fits within, or the line work, I should say, fits within a tight enough enclosure that I can easily capture um, what, what color I need to fill inside. And I'll show you what I mean by that. So if I um, select my magic wand tool in Photoshop, I'm gonna just click outside of, um, outside of this figure. And you can see because I've kept my line work sort of uh, all joining up and consistent throughout the outline of that picture, it's selected neatly the, um, the outside of that image. So if I press Q for a quick mask preview, you can see that. And now I'm going to just invert that mask and you can see I've selected just within that image. And now I can uh, make a new layer underneath. Um, I will fill that with a color um, and you can see it's sort of quickly filled that um, image. And that might not look like such a big deal, but when you've got, um, if we go back to our main image, when you've got all these images here, I'll go down to my figures folder. Um, and if I click the selection, you can see how detailed the selection needs to be to color in all these figures individually. So having that line work really tight and consistent allows me to select that, that, uh, that image much more easily. And that makes the coloring process that much more, more efficient. But I've got my, uh, my characters here on top. Uh, I can get rid of that white underlay that I had because it's nice and easy to see what I'm working on now. And now I'm going to uh, color these guys in. Um, the way that I do that is I like to, on projects like this, because it's such a big, busy image, you really want to be searching for any kind of, um, you're sort of trying to keep the detail of the image together, but it needs to still look uh, consistent, like it's in one place, not that it's it doesn't become sort of just visual, complete chaos. You still need a little bit of order there. And one of the best ways that you can do that is um, with color. So I've got a series of swatches here, and you can see within my swatches down in the bottom left, I've got a, a, a number of different uh, folders. And I keep those folders and I sort of make palettes for each drawing and try and stick to those palettes relatively rigorously. And it feels constrictive at first, but once you zoom out into the bigger image, um, having those palettes there really, um, uh, really gives a sense of uh, sort of consistency and order to your pictures. What I'm going to do is I'm going to just get the paint bucket tool um, and uh, I'm going to start dropping color in. I'm going to click the uh, all layers option, which is up the top in the paint bucket tool. And that just allows me to tap on my color layer beneath, but it will reference the line layer above it um, and give me um, a, a bit more control. So that really speeds up the process. Again, I'm sort of in this constant search for ways to sort of just shave a, uh, a couple of seconds off off my process because um, if you doing this once is no big deal, but doing it a uh, literally a hundred times for, for each picture, you just want any way possible to sort of speed up this process. So I'm just picking up a couple different colors, just simply knocking in those basic colors there. And then one trick I've learned for, for shading these kind of images is that I could select each of the individual colors and then go in and shade them. But what I might do is um, I'm going to make an adjustment layer over the top of the whole file. And I'm going to uh, darken and saturate the whole file there. 
but I just want to be able to paint with that adjustment layer onto my image. And then I'll be able to sort of add darkness and shadow consistently over the whole thing without having to select each section, each section of color. And that's something that uh, um, uh, really, really speeds up the process. Just got a message from my editor who's tuned into the, uh, the live stream. So hello, how you doing? Um, um, I'm glad you're able to see the process. Okay, so once I've um, made that adjustment layer on top, I'm just going to select a, um, a white brush and start painting within to that adjustment layer. So you can see now I'm sort of painting with shadow, but I can go across the colors. And this is something that just speeds up the process a little bit. So I'm painting that adjustment layer in, just getting a little bit of shadow on these two figures. Just make my brush a little bit smaller. And I'm not going for crazy detail here. You've got to remember this is going to be viewed about that big when it's printed in real life. So um, uh, they're, they're relatively straightforward drawings. Okay. Um, now I think I might just collapse all of that together. So we've got our, our figure with a the baby there. Now I'm going to shrink them down a little bit so they fit within here. A conversation that we've had on the live stream before um, is about sort of um, the ability in Photoshop to work what we call non-destructively. And it's this idea that you kind of, um, uh, you can edit your images, but you want, don't want to be destroying information stored with those, within those images. That sounds complicated, but I'll show you what I mean. So with this image, um, I've got her currently sitting in front of this handrail, but I want her to be sitting behind that handrail. I've got my handrail layer just here. So what I might do is I might select the handrail layer and then I'm going to apply a mask. Um, oh, let's invert that. And I'm going to apply a mask onto my figures here. And now you can see that my figure is sort of sitting behind that handrail there. And when I took mean um, non-destructive working, I could have just deleted the section of the figure, the section of the figure there. Um, and it would have appeared that she was sitting behind the handrail. But I want the option to be able to move this figure around, duplicate them, whatever I need to do. So um, by adding a mask instead of erasing, it's sort of this philosophy of non-destructive working. And especially with a picture like this, it's really important to me that I can duplicate things and uh, I sort of want to have all the materials uh, or all the information that I've worked up already at hand, ready to go. There's one mistake I've just uh, found, and I'll show you, um, it's actually a good example of, of what I mean. So um, there's a series of hidden images, uh, sort of hidden objects within this image. So if we go down here, you can see I've got, uh, there's one bulldog hidden, there's two castles, there's three post boxes. And um, for the consistency of the image and the ease of people being able to find the hidden things, um, I don't really wanna, and also for time, I don't really wanna redraw um, my post boxes every time. So there's three post boxes I'm trying to hide. So you can see I've got one here, uh, there's one hidden back here, and there's one hidden back here. Sorry, it's a bit of a spoiler if you're gonna be uh, going through the book later. Um, and I've just duplicated that post box three times. Um, but I, I wanna have access to the whole post box so I can use it at any time. So I've got um, my hidden elements folder. Uh, over on the right hand panel here. So I'll just open that one up. Um, so this is the folder that I keep all the hidden items within. So you can see if I select it or deselect it, they appear or disappear. And I've got them listed all down here. So you can see I've written down, you might not be able to see on the right hand panel, I've written down 10 rabbits, nine paper planes, eight pigeons, seven teacups, all that kind of thing. So if I scroll down to three letter boxes, um, you can see I've got this letterbox here. Um, now the mistake that I've made is that it's actually sitting in front of this telephone box rather than behind it. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna find my telephone box layer, which is here. I'm gonna select it. And then I've got a mask that's sitting over the whole folder of hidden items. So I can erase any section of the hidden items within that folder. So now I'm just gonna get my brush and I'm going to uh, paint away that section. So now it appears like the um, post box is nicely hidden behind the telephone box. So one of the things I love about working on these pictures is that um, it's, it's kind of 
the the best allegory that I feel like I can use is um, when I was a kid, I played a game called Age of Empires. And my favorite bit about that game was it had something called a map builder where you could select castles and um, uh, different uh, uh, sort of historical characters or knights or peasants or whatever, or trees. And you could build up these scenes by just clicking and adding them um, uh, into the image. And because I'm trying to sort of build efficiency as much as possible into these images, um, I kind of do a similar thing. I build up these libraries of assets and images that I can literally sort of drag and drop uh, into the image. Uh, I know that sounds quite a lot like cheating and <laughs> to a certain extent it is, but um, uh, there's a fine balance to be struck with these pictures of how much can I iterate on detail? How much life can I bring into it, but not end, end up looking like the whole thing is a sort of cut and paste job. You want it to feel um, like each picture is unique and original, and of course they all are, but if you can layer in more detail by duplicating things, that really helps you along the process. So you can see um, on my right hand panel, I've got my libraries here, and I've got all these different sort of Christmas themed assets that have built up uh, over the previous book, and I've started sort of um, adding new ones in. So if I want a uh, stone staircase, I can drag and drop my stone staircase from my libraries and it's in my file there. And then I can move it around, I can put it on different layers and I can add that or I can duplicate it to make a really long staircase. Um, so I don't, I don't necessarily go and sort of make these things for the sake of them being there from scratch. But as I go along, if I'm, if I'm drawing, say, a bit of this archway, I think, oh, that's something I might be able to use later. So I'll save it in a library. And then in the future, when I'm building things up, I can sort of drag and drop that out. And and um, over over time, you sort of really build up this really helpful library of, of objects that you can use. I'll show you something now, um, which is sort of a bit of the um, uh, behind the scenes stuff. So this is my resources folder on my computer. And these are assets that I've made myself and I'm sort of building up. So I've got uh, different stone wall textures that I can layer into buildings. Uh, I've got all kinds of different uh, tiles, terracotta tiles. This is a tile pattern I made for another um, festive Santa house image. Um, I've got uh, different plants that I've worked up. Um, I've got textures for um, sort of different floors, sort of uh, wooden planking, things like that. And it's one of those things that feels like a bit of over the top excessive work, but over the years, it's really built into this huge library that I can access at any time. So I'll just open up a um, quite a big file, it might take a second, oh, here we go. And this is my, my trees folder. Um, so I've got a file here that is filled with all different kinds of trees and rocks um, that I can drop into images. Um, so I've got some sort of basic plain trees there, got different shrubs, I've got all kinds of palm trees. And these are things that I've used on various jobs that I can sort of uh, replicate and build up. And it's it's a bit of sleight of hand. You never want to, um, you never want people to be able to notice this. You never want people to be able to see, oh, I've seen that eucalyptus tree before. Um, but if you can sort of subtly do it and sort of mix the replicated items in with new items along the way, um, you ended up with this sort of blended product that feels very full, but feels sort of fresh and, and, and unique each time. Um, so I'll just get rid of that. I'm going to save um, this image. I'm going to have to buy uh, a, a new beefier computer this year. This These files, I think they're about 700 megabytes, each one of these ones, but it's, it's really sort of uh, um, pretty computer intensive making these things. Okay. So um, that's a, a bit of a rundown of how one of these, these files work. Um, actually, sorry, before I go on, there's one thing that I really enjoyed working on in this file that I thought I might just show you. So I've already saved it. I'm not gonna worry about doing that again. But if I go into um, a, a folder I've just called rear, which is kind of the, um, the, the uh, it's not the foreground, it's the background, the background of the image. You can see there's, um, different trees um, that I can turn on and off. There's one in the background there that I'm going to, going to switch on and off. Um, and I've got this um, fabulous green uh, steam train that goes through the middle of the picture. Now with a picture like this, because it's um, so big, it's using up a lot of computing power. 
Um, if I want to do something quite detailed like this, um, I find it easier to sort of have in a separate file. So what I've done with this one is I've made something called a linked file, which is if I double click um, on this train, you can see I've got a whole separate file that's just the train by itself. And I can simply work on that um, uh, uh, as I'm going on. And um, I find that a really good way to sort of um, uh, just be able to uh, focus on sort of the task at hand and just complete this train. And then I can drag and drop it into the main file. And the great thing about this as well is that I can edit the train. So say I wanted a weird looking purple train. Um, I can take that um, and I will save that original file, um, go into my main file, and you can see it's updated that within the main file. So it's this great way that I can sort of work on two different things at once and sort of compile them within one, one larger image. Okay, I'm gonna undo that because I think the green train looks a lot better. So let's save that and make sure everything is intact and we've got a green train back, which is good. Okay, so um, yeah, that's that's kind of the layout of um, uh, how these these pictures work. Um, so for now, I will go on to working on one of the patterns, and I'll show you how that comes together. It's quite a different uh, style of working, but it's something I'm really excited about, and it's a, a really cool new feature in Photoshop. Um, uh, with them. Um, Sorry, I've just had a question come in from RB. So um, thank you very much, RB. Um, uh, RB's just asking, um, when you do the, the base covers of the inside art or just side on the covers up front, uh, so do I um, finish all the artwork inside the book and then decide on the cover? Um, it's a little bit of both, RB. So um, for the most part, I will do all the artwork inside the book. And often um, the cover is a way to sort of give a little sampler of what's inside. So um, um, uh, often the artwork that I finish inside the book will kind of inform what's on the cover, but you'd still like the cover to be something fresh and interesting. You don't want to just replicate a page. So often I will um, finish the artwork inside the book, come up with a sort of greater concept um, for what the cover will be. And then I sort of might use sections of the inside of the artwork um, or artwork inside the book to kind of inform what's on the cover because um, you really want them to sort of work in, in parallel. So thank you for that question. If any more come up, please send them through. Okay, so I'm gonna open up a, um, a new file here. Uh, let's just go with a 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter file. And I'll show you this feature that I've really been enjoying um, in Photoshop. So again, um, I'm, I'm doing the kind of patterned pages that we were talking about inside, the, what they call the end pages. But the way, I'll, maybe I'll show you how I used to do this. So the way I used to make a pattern is that um, you're kind of making a, uh, a tessellating pattern. And the way I used to do that before was that I would make a shape and you can make an interesting tessellating pattern by making a shape that is um, the same shape on um, both the sides, um, the left and right and the top and bottom. So if I take, this squiggly line duplicated across um, and let's make a, another squiggly line for the top. Now I will duplicate that down so we've got the same line. So I've got this kind of wacky shape but it's like a puzzle piece. So if I shrink it down you can see if I duplicate that across it tessellates perfectly with itself because the sides and the top and bottom are the same. So if I was going to go back and um, take this and I'll put a little bauble in here and I'll put a candy cane in and a star and some dots, whatever, I make this pattern and then I can duplicate it across and I've got a nice tessellating pattern already. That's the most basic way you can make a simple tessellating pattern. So essentially for these cover pages, I'll do a much more advanced version of this. Um, the problem with this is that you kind of have to work on your single tile and then kind of try and imagine what it will look like once it's it's tessellating and all coming together. So Photoshop has come up with a, um, a, a great um, new view option called Pattern Preview. So it's under view um, in the top folder. There's one called Pattern Preview. Uh, let me say, okay. And what it does with this is that it takes a single drawing that you're doing and duplicates it 
almost infinitely around so you can see what your drawing would look like if it was a pattern. Um, so it's easier that I just show you what this looks like rather than tell you. So if I've got a, uh, a bauble here on top and there's a piece of vine that goes like this uh, and it's got a leaf coming off the vine and another leaf coming up here. You can see that Photoshop is automatically duplicating its pattern and making an almost infinite pattern out of it. So I can zoom in and say, I want to make a little change here. I'm going to put a star here and a circle here. I can zoom out and instantly see what that's going to look like as a, as a broader pattern. And this really excites me for, for these kind of things because you can easily make these super complicated patterns um, and uh, uh, you know that they will tessellate perfectly. And it's just, it's just a really fun way of sketching. Um, and it feels like you've done lots of work when you've actually done very little work. So what I was hoping to do today is to just start sketching out some ideas for a, a duplicating pattern that will go into this book. And um, we're gonna be doing another session on Thursday and uh, hopefully we can finish um, that pattern um, over the course of Thursday. So um, yeah, I'm just gonna start sketching and we'll see what we come up with. Um, Okay, I'm going to get a, uh, uh, a nice, um, simple brush. So, I was thinking about this pattern. I really haven't um, come to any conclusions as to what it's going to be yet, but I want, would like it to have something that looks vaguely like a, a, a wreath. Um, but uh, one that um, is sort of nicely complicated. So it's going to be sort of based on, on um, sort of, holly and leaves with, with um, different, um, different uh, objects hidden in it. So there'll be sort of stars and candy canes and elves and things like that hidden within uh, this image. Um, and uh, we'll just, um, oh, sorry guys. Oh. Okay, so you can kind of see how that pattern's starting to come out. It's a little uniform for my liking. So let's try and add a little bit of uh, complexity. So I'm just going to start off with some very basic shapes of what I think this pattern could look like. And you can see you can draw right out of the canvas. So this little square here indicates where my canvas is, but Photoshop allows me to just draw straight off the edge of the canvas and into the repeating pattern section. So it all feels very, very natural for making these kind of patterns. And you can see I've already got something quite lovely and, uh, um, and complex coming together. So I'm just going to keep going with these kind of curly motifs and hopefully we can build these into something really quite nice and complicated. So I'm going to try and make some of these lines overlap each other a little bit and um, uh, make it into some sort of quite, quite dense vine. Um, if, if anybody's interested in pattern making, it's worth uh, looking up a man called William Morris, who um, is sort of the big granddaddy of, of floral complicated designs, who was doing amazing work in Britain uh, during the arts and crafts movement, which is sort of the, um, uh, gosh, I'm going to get my dates wrong, but it's sort of late 1800s, I think. Um, he was making stuff, and he largely made these for, for wallpapers, but they're um, absolutely um, lovely things. I, he would have killed for um, this kind of capability, I bet. Okay, so I've got something, I don't want to really overcomplicate it at this point, but I think I've got an interesting kind of outline for what this, this pattern looks like. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop my opacity down, and let's start just kind of working within this format now and coming up with something a bit more complex. Um, we've just got a, uh, another question uh, coming in asking about um, what my computer spec is, because I was talking about this um, being a quite sort of um, the, uh, the files for the book that I was working on earlier being quite complex um, files. Um, I'm actually working on a really old computer. I, it, it needs to be uh, re refurbished soon. It was, a, it was a very powerful computer when I bought it, but that was I think it's actually a 2013 model. So this is an eight-year-old computer that I'm working on. So believe me, I'm, I'm complaining about needing a lot of power, but um, the majority of modern computers could do this just fine. I think it's a 16 gigabyte um, RAM that I'm working with. 
Um, and I couldn't tell you what the, I think it might be an i7 processor. Um, and uh, it's, it's an eight core machine though. That's probably the biggest difference. But with, with this kind of drawing, um, especially the pattern drawing takes next to no computing power. This is just, this is just fine. So um, don't, don't feel like um, uh, doing these kinds of things is, is prohibited, like computing power would be prohibitive to it. So I'm gonna start adding in some kind of uh, Christmassy leaf shape. So let's make something that's a bit like holly coming out of here. Got a, uh, a little bell there. Might have some berries and maybe let's make some more holly coming out of here. It's, a, it, it's, a, it's very satisfying doing these kind of things and seeing them come together so quickly. Got about, uh, um, um, got about 15 minutes left to go. So we'll just keep piecing this together. One thing I might show you with this is um, the ability to work with um, smart objects um, in a pattern like this. And it's something I'm going to do quite a lot um, later on. But I want the option to sort of um, not just be sketching things in, but dropping objects into this picture and um, being able to edit them freely. So I was talking about uh, the libraries that we had before. So let me just drag and drop a candy cane in here. And I'll shrink that candy cane around and move it around. So this is one that I drew for the first elf book. So you can see it's um, uh, sitting there in my layers panel, but it's it's in the um, it's already in the, the pattern. So I can move it around, I can move it out of frame and it stays within the, the whole expanding pattern. So maybe I'll have a candy cane here that's sort of looping over this design. So I'm just gonna make a mask for that. And like we were saying before about not working destructively, I'm just gonna paint uh, a bit of that candy cane out in the mask so we can kind of, sort of incorporate it into our existing design. So let's go back to sketching. Uh, I have some more leaves coming down here. Might be nice to incorporate some, I've done some wreaths before using some uh, Australian flowers. So it might be nice to have something like that. I could have like a bit of a, a protea or something coming down from here. Maybe some some uh, wattle flowers coming out from here. So again, you can see I'm just kind of loosely sticking to the, um, the, the, the broader template that I had before. Um, and uh, just, uh, just building building up on that. Um, so we're going to have a broader sweep that um, joins these two up. So I want a nice smooth line that's going to join those up. Um, I've got to think of some more Christmassy items. Maybe we'll have a, uh, uh, a cup of um, tea for uh, Santa on a saucer um, uh, with a uh, cookie. Santa as well. Oh, sorry, it's milk and cookies. Okay, anyway, it's going to be a cup of tea. Um, so we've got a nice cup of tea there with a cookie. And maybe that could be sort of held up by a leaf, like a, a waiter's hand or something. So we're going to just um, keep covering that. And you can see, gosh, we've got quite a complex pattern coming together already, but it's it's, uh, I think I'm, I'm someone who really loves building up detail and this is a perfect um, sort of reason to just get, get kind of lost in it doing these, these kind of drawings. Um, so we had one bell there. It might be nice to have something else like that. Um, just trying to think of, um, let me go to my libraries and try and get some inspiration for Christmas items. Nice to have just a, a bow. Oh, we could have a star. So I've got this star here. I might just put this in as a kind of um, placeholder for now. I don't think we'll use that as our final star. But um, let's find a way to incorporate that one in. So I'll go back to my sketch layer and I'm going to sort of find a way to I actually put that beneath. And let's curl that around. So it's going to be like a little tendril holding onto the star. So let me just erase that away. 
So right now I'm not, I'm not making anything that will be part of the final product. I'm just kind of building up visual ideas into something that, that, that feels right. I think because I'm playing around with this tool for the first time, I really want to try and kind of push it and see what I can do. So it'll be really fun to see um, how complex I can kind of go with this, this image. So I'm going to start crossing over my existing image and I, and I want something because it's a repeating pattern. Again, like I was saying with uh, the images that you're dropping into uh, um, um, the existing image, you don't want to give the, the it, it feels like a bit of a cop out when it's too clear that something is replicated. Um, so by adding sort of further complexity to this image, I'm sort of confusing your eye um and um giving uh, a bit more of a sense that this is um this is sort of like an endless complexity it'd be nice to have a um uh some sort of uh present in here so um, um i'm just gonna start drawing in this sort of rectangular prism shape um and we'll put a bit of uh uh, a, a ribbon that goes all around the, the, the present. Drawn a lot of presents in my time doing these books. Put a bit of a, a ribbon on top. Um, and again, to sort of confuse the visual, the, 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 the eye, I'm going to put another tendril kind of crossing out part of that present. And we're just adding further complexity as we go along. Hmm. Now I might start um, making some more finalized um, copies here. Better go ahead and save my work before I get lost in the ether. So I'm just going to call it pattern. Save. Okay. Um, now I'm only working with uh, 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters, which isn't quite enough, and it's only 200 pixels per inch. So let's put that up to 400. So we're doubling the size of our image. And just with, with print jobs like this, um, you just want to be giving yourself as much um, sort of flexibility in terms of the size that you want to print at. And so um, let's go back to our pattern preview. Okay. Uh, and now I'm going to start adding some detail to one of these objects. All right, so I'm going to start doing some sort of solid, solid line work on this one. Um, what I like to do with uh, symmetrical objects, objects like this, I think almost to a, a fault, I'm I'm interested in um, maximizing the, um, the the efficiency of of what I'm drawing. So I'm going to um, uh, because it's a symmetrical object. I don't really need to draw both sides of it. I'm just going to try and draw one half of it nicely and then I'll flip the whole thing over and then we'll have a whole cut. Just little things like that. They're just going to save you a little bit of time, but they all sort of build up over time. So we're just knocking out some bits of that mug. Now I'm going to cut it off at about halfway. I'm going to flip it over. Got a nice whole mug there. Add a little curve to that handle. And this is where I can kind of start just really enjoying the, 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 the detail of the image. I'm not looking at the, the broader composition. I'm just kind of piecing this one together. I put a spoon poking out the top. I've got about 10 minutes left here. So we're just going to keep adding detail to this one for the rest of the time. But, um, I hope this has been uh, interesting. I mean, if, if anybody has more questions, feel to get free to get in touch um, uh, throughout uh, the rest of today and tomorrow. And I can hopefully come back with the answers to any questions you might have on Thursday when we continue with this. And hopefully I'll have a little bit more progress made with the overall picture. Use this for all kinds of things, this pattern making thing. I mean, you could do stuff that was really abstract actually. Um, and I love making things like this because it's, it's like, it's like making a texture or a tool that you can use later on because you can start applying it to, I don't know, you could print 
they're in bags or we've made, um, me and my partner have made sort of Christmas wrapping paper um, using approaches like this before. It's just a really nice thing to have. Okay, so I'm just gonna um, select the colors inside my mug and I'll start uh, coloring this guy in. Let's start with a bit of uh, pink is my underlay. And you can see um, if I um, zoom out a bit on this, you can see I've got, I can kind of start seeing how all my colors are working together um, uh, as the overall image. What I might do at this point is um, just kind of start knocking out some, some sort of baseline colors so I can get a sense of what I'm, what I'm working with. So I could change my background color to maybe a um, red. And let's start just painting in some really broad sweeps of color to give us a sense of where we're going with this. It's such a, a visually fun thing to, to, to look at this whole thing. Um, these, these patterns coming together. So for some of these tendrils, maybe I'll go with a darker green. Hopefully you can still see my, my sketch sitting on top of that. Maybe I'll just duplicate that um, so it's clear. Sometimes I find that when you're doing just line work, it kind of confuses your eye a little bit and you can't see how much detail you're actually working with. So I'm just blocking in a bit of color to, to give myself a, a better feel for, for what that is. Now it's always nice with these things to give them a little bit of um, um, bling with some, some gold. So I'm just gonna try some intense yellow coming down through there. I'll go back to working on detail at some point, but just doing this right now um, gives me a much, much better sense of what the overall pattern feel is gonna be. Let's go back to doing some dark green in this little curve around the star. It gives you sort of different interesting visual ideas as well. Like uh, it'd be really fun to try some sort of kind of uh, almost sort of filigree-like lines uh, in the yellow, something like that. Seeing how they start to play together in the overall pattern. Because it, the, the symmetry on this, uh, on this is kind of automatic, you can only really go so wrong. I'm sure there are some pattern makers that could be watching who disagree with that, but... Uh, I'm enjoying just playing around with it. Okay, so I'm just putting that little tendril underneath our cup. Okay, I might just continue uh, coloring in that guy a little bit. So we're going to start adding in some of those detail colors. It's a very soothing process doing things like this. There's uh, some great uh, symmetry drawing tools that have been introduced um, uh, into uh, Fresco if you're working on an iPad as well. I don't know if they have the pattern tool quite the same, um, but um, if you're just looking at sort of duplicating designs uh, along a, uh, a symmetrical axis, there's lots of really fun stuff you can do um, in Fresco doing that as well. Okay, so I'm just going to select that broader pink pattern and start shading that in now. I love the feeling with uh, making patterns like this that you're sort of um, getting work for free almost. I mean, I know it's just the computer replicating the pattern, but I sort of do a little bit of shading. Um, and then you pan out and you go, oh, wow, look at all the work I've done. 
Okay. Um, I'm just doing a little bit of shading on that, that, that blue section as well. And what I'm going to do throughout the, um, the, the picture is just kind of work up these things that I would sort of almost call assets, like the, um, the, the teacup. Um, I'm going to sort of work up maybe six or seven of those, and then I can start sort of just moving them around and, and thinking sort of like, oh, is it better if it's balanced over here or over there? And once I've got a, a number of those together, it should be fun just kind of playing, playing with, with how they all fit together. So uh, I might um, leave that pattern there. It looks like a little bit of chaos, but um, uh, I promise when we get back to it on Thursday, um, we'll have um, uh, something a little bit more finished to work with. And it's really exciting doing something like this on stream um, with the knowledge it will be uh, turning up in a book um, um, soon. So uh, hopefully the idea, once we've finished this pattern, it will be sort of um, in the, uh, the next Where Santa's Off book. I don't know if you can see me in the little thumbnail. But I did this kind of simple pattern on the first one, and hopefully this one will be a slightly more complex version for Where Santa's Elf Around the World, coming out this Christmas. So um, yeah, really exciting to, to, to do it with you guys. So I think I will just take us back to um, uh, where we were looking at um, uh, some of the... Um, the pictures from the book. So, um, yeah, so this is where we started and um, we've uh, incorporated one character into um, uh, this larger scene. And um, yeah, I might wrap it up uh, there, but um, thank you so much everyone for tuning in today. It's been um, really great talking with you about uh, this, this really exciting project. And um, I hope you guys got uh, got something out of it. Um, it's 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 fun, sort of trying to sort of just demystify the uh, the process of making these books a little bit. Um, uh, but it's uh, it's great, sort of. Um, I don't know. It's one of these things I kind of uh, work on in isolation, trying to trying to piece these things together. And uh, there's no manual for it. I'm kind of uh, making the process as I go. So it's 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 really cool to share with some people. So um, yeah, I might leave it there, but I uh, hope you all have a wonderful Tuesday and um, hopefully see you this Thursday. Okay, I might uh, sign off there. All right, thanks so much everyone.